Hello and welcome to my talk. Today I want to talk about the security of IoT firmware. I conducted a large scale security analysis on firmware and in this talk I want to give you a high level overview about what I've done and my results. A few words about me. My name is Daniel Nusko. I'm from Germany and working as a penetration tester. So my job is to discover vulnerabilities in corporate networks and applications. I have a special interest in the field of IoT security. Um, that's why I conducted a large scale static analysis on firmware. And that's my topic for today. Before we start, a short introduction. Why are IoT devices interesting? And especially, why should we care about the security of them? Well, today we have more and more connected devices um, in our homes as well as in corporate networks. For example, we have home automation systems which can be managed by a smartphone. Um, we have smart speakers that are connected to our Wi-Fi. And of course, we also have uh, a lot of regular internet devices like a router, a surveillance camera, a wipe phone, and so on and so on. But we also have more and more industrial devices um, like industrial control systems to control machines, for example. Um, we have robotics or solar power plants and all of these devices are connected to the network to monitor and manage them. So you see IoT devices are more and more common and more and more widespread. Today we have about 36 billion devices worldwide and the number of devices rises from year to year. So in 2025, um, we expect to have more than 75 billion IoT devices. And a lot of them are connected to our internet. So what does this mean? Let's take a look in the past. Um, in 2016, we had about 18 billion devices. And in the same year, the Mirai botnet compromised about 600,000 IoT devices. Um, these devices were responsible for large distributed denial of service attacks. For example, one of these attacks hit the internet service provider of Liberia. And this attack was so heavy that the internet connectivity of the whole country was temporarily interrupted. So according to the statistics, we will have four times as much devices in 2025 as in 2016. And additionally, you have to know that the original version of the Murai botnet just used a simple list of default credentials. And these default credentials, um, yes, was used to get access to these devices. And I assume that much more devices can be compromised by using publicly available exploits. So we have more and more devices. All of these devices are connected to our network. All of them have interfaces to manage them. For example, a web interface. Um, some of them also provide other network services, which all pose an attack surface. The security of IoT devices is known to be poor, but what are the reasons for such bad product security? Wireless devices are often produced as cheap as possible. Um, there's a hard competition between the vendors and product security costs money and yes, it's not the vendor's first priority. In addition, these devices are very diverse and very individual. Um, not only the hardware, but also the software. Um, a lot of software components are developed by the vendor itself, which increases the risks of design flaws um, compared to well-known and standardized components. And IoT devices have a short life cycle. Um, I will come to that point later at the end of my talk. Okay, before we start diving into a large scale analysis, I want to share my experience from a penetration test. Um, I conducted a penetration test of a security camera. And now I want to mention three of the identified vulnerabilities. First, a buffer overflow, um, which was located in the web interface of the device and a denial of service vulnerability, also affecting the web interface and also here in this case, um, the web server binary was self-developed by the vendor. And I've seen this many times before that vulnerabilities are often located in self-developed com components. 
I've identified a debug interface um, that can be accessed over the network. And yes, this debug interface is, uh, yeah, enabled by default and allows to create memory dumps. And yeah, you can reach this debug interface over the network so everybody is able to access it. The interesting thing about that IP camera was uh, that this device was white labeled. So on the camera, there was a company logo of a German vendor, but in fact, this device was produced by a Chinese manufacturer. And a little research showed that this manufacturer is the second largest manufacturer of IP cameras in the world. And a little more research showed that um, IoT devices from this manufacturer were significantly evolved into the Mirai botnet. So it seems that the circumstance that uh, this device was white labeled and at the end sold by another vendor um, lead to several problems. First, um, when I informed the vendor about the debugging interface, um, it turned out that the vendor didn't even know about that feature. And second, um, it turned out that some of the identified vulnerabilities um, are already known by the Chinese manufacturer and are also fixed in a newer firmware version. So someone took a closer look on this device, um, uh, discovered vulnerabilities, reported them to the manufacturer and the manufacturer released a new firmware version where these vulnerabilities have been fixed. So this is the best case you can get and even here the device yeah stays vulnerable because yeah of communication problems between the original manufacturer of the device and the vendor um, who sells this product in Germany. So the vendor didn't even know about the firmware and shipped their products with the old and vulnerable firmware versions. So this example shows that there can be many many different reasons that lead to bad product security. Um, not only programming mistakes. Okay, since we cannot rely on the product security, we need to evaluate the security of these devices and therefore several approaches exist. Um, we can perform a penetration test. Here we look at the device and its interfaces while it's in operation. For that, of course, we need the physical device. Um, but we can analyze the device in depth and so we can get very, very accurate results because we avoid false positives by verifying the vulnerability directly on the device. But um, this approach simply does not scale, so um, it's not practical for a large scale analysis. We also have the possibility to emulate a firmware. Um, we can use QEMO for that purpose. Um, but uh, this is hard to apply because the hardware of IoT devices um, is very diverse. Usually if you try to dynamically execute a firmware, it is checked if the peripherals are connected and if they are working. Um, the device may have a sensor to collect data or a camera or a physical button, um, which we don't have when we emulate them. There also have been attempts to emulate um, only single parts of the firmware. For example, um, emulating only the web interface and this approach allows to run common vulnerability scanners um, on the web interface, although the device is not physically present. Um, but the setup here is really complex and it's very difficult to automate this process um, for a large scale analysis. This is the reason why I chose a static analysis. Um, in this approach, we unpack the file system and the binaries and then we analyze them. And of course, this approach is much more limited um, because we don't have the device up and running and uh, yeah, we cannot communicate with network services of the device. Um, but it's scalable and the whole process can be automated to analyze a large amount of firmware images. The aim of this research was to obtain a high level overview about the security level of firmware and therefore a large number of firmware files um, from different vendors and also different device types was collected. 
and due to the large number of firmware files, um, it was necessary to fully automate the process of unpacking and analysis. So at the end, uh, every firmware file was analyzed with regard to several topics. Um, first of all, the name and version information of common binaries and um, common system libraries have been identified. So in the first step, the file type was identified and in case of an executable file, like an ELF file, um, printable strings were extracted. And after that, um, these strings were analyzed using regular expressions for typical version information. So the name of typical software components like OpenSSL, BusyBox or OpenSSH, along with their numerical software version was extracted from the binary. And in this way, it was identified which software has been used and in which version. So um, for that, uh, I use regular expressions in combination with Yara files. Um, Yara is a signature format um, which was originally developed for malware detection and was used for antivirus software. Then I checked every binary file for the use of um, compiler-based exploit mitigations. Um, to give an example, when compiling a program with GCC, uh, you can set different flags to enable exploit mitigations, um, like stack smashing protection or NX protection. And uh, yeah, this makes exploitation of buffer overflow vulnerabilities much more difficult. Another aspect was the analysis of default user accounts. Um, in this case, the passwd file was analyzed as well as the shadow file and password hashes from shadow files have been extracted. And after that, a dictionary attack was conducted to recover as much plain text passwords as possible. And in the last step, cryptographic material was identified, um, such as certificates, private and public keys. And this was also implemented by signatures in Yara format. So how do we perform a large scale analysis? Um, there are several tasks to do. First of all, we need to collect firmware images. And after that, we need to unpack the firmware file in order to access the file and directory structure of them. When this is done, um, we are ready to start our analysis processes for every file and a set of checks is performed for every file. So we check the file type and in case of an executable file, um, we analyze if exploit mitigations are implemented. We scan the file for version strings and also for cryptographic keys and certificates. All results of this analysis are stored in a database. Um, in addition to the results, I also collected some metadata of all files, um, which I also store in the database. For example, I created a hash value of each extracted file. And um, yes, this allows to analyze if a file was also present in another firmware image. So in case we have a finding, let's say um, hard-coded certificate, we can use the hash value of this file and search in our database if this specific certificate um, is also used in another firmware. When our automated analysis finished, we can use our database to create statistics um, about our results or to search for files inside a specific image and to manually analyze them. All right, let's take a look on the architecture of my analysis environment. Um, during my first tests, it got clear that, um, yeah, the analysis has high system requirements. Um, a large number of files are examined in parallel and therefore uh, the analysis scales with the number of available CPU cores and system memory. And this was the reason why I decided to, uh, yeah, to run this analysis um, in the cloud environment. Uh, the analysis itself was implemented in Python using the fact framework. 
and uh, the fact framework is built modular so uh, it's easy to create custom modules in Python. So as you see we have different components. Um, we have the firmware analysis server. Here we unpack the firmware images and analyze the files. All unpacked files are stored on a virtual storage. Um, we keep all unpacked files since we also may want to analyze the manual afterwards. And uh, yeah, we also have a database server. Um, this database server is based on MongoDB and here we store all our results. All these components are located in the cloud. Um, I've also developed a job scheduler that uploads a firmware file um, to the analyzer server in the cloud environment and uh, also monitors all tasks on the server. Uh, this is done by a REST interface. Where did I get the firmware files from? Um, I downloaded the firmware files from manufacturers' websites or FTP servers. Um, thereby, I only collected firmware images that are directly provided by the manufacturer. Um, doing so, I can be sure that I analyze the original firmware from the vendor and not any other image um, which might be customized by someone else. To automate the process of downloading of firmware files, um, I developed a crawler. Um, I developed this crawler in Python based on the Scrappy framework. And uh, in this way, I crawled the download pages of 20 vendors and downloaded about 10,000 firmware files. So I manually searched for the download portal of a vendor and then I crawled the portal for firmware files um, with my Python crawler. Together with the firmware files, um, I also stored some uh, metadata about the images. Um, for example, I generated a hash value of each firmware file um, to avoid duplicates and uh, stored the URL where I downloaded the file from. And as you can see on this pie chart, um, most of the firmware files are for routers, um, followed by security cameras, um, printers, switches and VoIP phones and uh, a smaller number of images are for NAS systems, smart speakers, Wi-Fi repeaters, VoIP gateways, um, photovoltaic systems, smart locks, smart plugs and power line adapters. So as you can see a wide range of device types has been analyzed. So let's talk about the unpacking of the firmware. Um, most of the devices I analyzed have a full operating system. So you have a kernel, you have a user space and a file system. And uh, yeah, the, file, uh, the firmware files are often packed in multiple layers and different file formats. So uh, the challenge is to handle a wide range of file and archive formats and to unpack them in an automated way, layer by layer. Manufacturers often provide firmware images in an archive file and uh, after this archive file is unpacked, you often get the binary blob. And to extract files from this binary blob, um, we use so-called file carving. Uh, this means um, we search for common file signatures and magic bytes within this binary blob and then try to carve and to extract um, files inside. One very good tool for this is Spinwalk, um, which I also used in this case in my analysis. Uh, uh, Spinwalk is uh, yeah, a well-known tool, um, which is very popular um, for firmware reverse engineering. Um, so uh, yeah, this was uh, the tool I chose for this. Okay, let's take a look on the results and start with some general observations. Um, the results show that the majority of the analyzed firmware images are based on a Linux kernel. So uh, in 88% of all firmware files, a Linux kernel was identified um, with about 6% ThreadX is used, um, which is a proprietary operating system often used for consumer electronics. 
and uh, in two percent of the firmware files um, open WRT is used. Uh, this is uh, a Linux based operating system um, used for routers. Then we have a small number of devices which use VXWorks, uh, WindRevel Linux and Lynx OS. On the right side uh, you can see statistics about the identified CPU architecture. Um, most of the devices are based on MIPS and um, an ARM uh, CPU. Uh, this is very very common for IoT devices um, but we also have some uh, yeah, architectures that are not that common like M68K from Motorola or SuperH um, which is a microcontroller from Hitachi. This chart illustrates the number of times a specific software component was identified among all firmware images. Uh, the most commonly identified software component is OpenSSL, followed by BusyBox, um, which is very common in embedded Linux. Uh, this is a single executable file which combines a set of command line tools. We also see a lot of binaries that provide common network services like UDHCP, um, OpenSSH, DNS mask and dropbear SSH. And for all these programs also their version has been identified. Um, in this way we got an overview of the use of outdated software components. Okay, here you can see the version landscape of OpenSSL as an example. So we see how often a specific version has been identified. Actually, this is not a complete list as uh, yeah, the complete list would be much too long. Um, these are only the most frequently used versions and uh, the extracted version information was uh, then compared with the data of the National Vulnerability Database from the uh, NIST Institute. And in this way, for each version, already known vulnerabilities and their CVE numbers have been identified. As example, the bar graph on the left um, shows the number of vulnerabilities according to the CSS score. Um, in this example for OpenSSL 0.9.8 set. And in this way, um, we can find out vulnerabilities which affect this version and also their severity. Just some interesting statistics regarding three famous vulnerabilities in OpenSSL. Um, according to their version information, about 75% are affected by the freak vulnerability, about 50% are affected by Poodle and 6% by the Heartblade vulnerability. Here OpenSSL is just an example. Um, I created such kind of statistics for all software components also for the identified Linux kernel versions and uh, the re results show that um, two of three kernel versions are older than 10 years and more than 90% of all Linux kernels are already um, end of life and the oldest kernel version I found was from 1997. When I crawled the download portals, of course also film images of old devices have been downloaded. So uh, it was not possible to distinguish between old and new devices. Um, this is something you have to do manually. Uh, you have to look for the release date of a firmware on the website of the vendor or for example take a look in the changelog of the firmware. You cannot do that in an automated way. That's why I did some manual research and compared the release dates of some single devices with their kernel version and the results differed very strongly from manufacturer to manufacturer and it turned out that for example at product launch of some enterprise VoIP telephones a kernel version was in use that was already 10 years old. So even current high-end phones which are dedicated to the enterprise market are sold with a strongly outdated Linux kernel. Let's take a look on binary hardening statistics. 
All ELF executables and libraries are checked for the use of common exploit mitigations. So uh, when you compile a binary, you can set compiler flags to make use of them and to make exploitation much more difficult. And here you can see the results when compiling a program with GCC NX, the no execution bit is set by default. Um, I think this explains why 90% of all analyzed binaries make use of NX. As far as I know, all other protection mechanisms like stack canaries, rel row and fortify source must be explicitly enabled during compilation. And I think this is the reason why they are not that present in most of the ex executable files. Okay, as already mentioned, I also analyzed the pestwdo and shadow files. Um, this chart here shows the number of users which are allowed to log into the operating system and for which a hard-coded password is set in a shadow file. So all of these users here, um, yes, can be used to log into the device. Several of them um, show typical usernames for factory default credentials, um, such as root and admin or user and guest, but uh, you also see some users with cryptic names. And in the past, we've seen several cases where such cryptic usernames, um, yes, have been identified as undocumented static user account. So in case an SSH or a telnet service is running, um, these accounts can be used for remote access to the device. Some of these cryptic usernames in this list here um, are already known and you can find CVE numbers about them, but others are still unknown. So static user accounts, especially when they are undocumented, um, are a real problem. From all shadow files, I extracted the password hashes. Um, I performed a dictionary attack on them to recover um, yeah, as much passwords as possible. And the results show that um, pass was the most common um, uh, hard-coded password, uh, followed by 1234 and an empty password. And all in all, 68% um, of all hard-coded passwords um, have been recovered. The Mirai botnet used a total of 62 predefined combinations of factory default usernames and passwords, and 12 of them were also ident identified here um, in this research. But please keep in mind, um, these are the results of a static analysis. Um, we don't even know if there is uh, yes, a, a service running that could allow user login. And in addition, we cannot know what happens at runtime. Um, so this is like a snapshot of the device software, um, which we shut before the first boot of the operating system. And maybe after the first boot process or during the first boot process, uh, the user is forced to change um, the default credentials. Uh, so this is one of the disadvantages um, of a static analysis we have here. As part of the analysis, also cryptographic material has been extracted. Um, this table here uh, lists the number of cryptographic keys by their type. Most of them are TLS certificates. Among them are a lot of root certificates um, but also hard-coded and self signed certificates. Also a lot of RSA keys. Um, some of them belong to their corresponding TLS certificate. Others are used for SSH. And regarding SSH, um, most of the RSA keys are identified as SSH host keys. And a few public keys um, have been identified, um, which are used for key-based authentication. But uh, I will come to that point later. So what's the problem with hard-coded keys? Um, let's have a look on the principle of asymmetric encryption. On our device, uh, we generate an individual pair of keys, let's say an RSA keys. So now we have two different keys, a private key, um, which we keep secret on the device and a public key, which we provide to our clients. And uh, our client uh, is now able to encrypt a message using this public key. But the only one who is able to decrypt this message is the owner of the private key. So the security is based on keeping the private key secret. 
and in, in case of an hard-coded certificate, um, all devices with that firmware use the same public and same private key. So, for example, the device may use these keys for HTTPS communication um, to the web interface, and in this case, an attacker could easily decrypt the TLS traffic by just extracting the private key from the firmware. And yes, the firmware is publicly available on the internet, so extracting the private key shouldn't be a problem. In many firmware files, um, I've seen hard-coded certificates and hard-coded SSH host keys, uh, but also here um, we cannot absolutely rely on the results um, because the device may regenerate a, um, a key pair during the first boot process and uh, thus override the hard-coded key pair. And we simply cannot verify that with a static analysis. In addition to that, um, hard-coded TLS keys can be used to uh, yes to identify the IP address of public public reachable devices. Um, here you can see an example where you show them um, to search for IoT devices by a certificate fingerprint, and as this certificate is hard-coded, all devices use the same certificate with the same fingerprint. That means that I can use this approach to uh, yes to identify the IP addresses of all internet reachable devices. And this can be used to conduct very, very targeted attacks on specific device models. For example, to connect um, to these devices with an hard-coded password um, that I've extracted before from the firmware or any, any other attack. After the automated analysis finished, I had a large database of extracted files and a lot of metadata about them. I used this database for further manual analysis. Um, for example, I used the metadata of all identified RSA keys to search for the file name authorized keys. This file allows key-based authentication, so the owner of the private key is able to log into the device um, in case an SSH service is running. In firmware images of four different routers, um, I've identified an authorized keys file. Three of them offer an SSH service according to the user manual. So I contacted the vendor and described the problem, but the vendor rejected that and claimed that key-based authentication would be disabled. A little research showed that for Dropbear, um, which was used in this case for SSH, uh, you cannot do that by configuration. You have to compile the executable um, explicitly without key-based authentication. So I did that and yeah, compared the binary I've extracted um, with the compiled one and looked for the function call used for key-based authentication. And I also found it in the, in the extracted drop executable. So I'm pretty sure that key-based authentication is possible and that the owner of the private key is able to log into the device. But I cannot prove that um, because I don't have access to one of these devices. So uh, yes, this was really frustrating for me. Okay, I also analyzed all extracted files with regard to, yeah, let's say suspicious strings and uh, thereby I found a CGI script um, which is part of the web interface. Um, I've identified this file in firmware files of um, nine different devices. Um, and yes, when this CGI script is called, a Telnet service is started and a new user is created. And this script um, was identified in different versions. Um, in a newer version, an SSH service is started instead of Telnet. And the name um, of the created user account is NSA Rescue Angel. And all of the affected products are network attached storage systems and most of them are yeah from the vendor's product line called NSA. So I think that uh, lead to the username NSA Rescue Angel. I reported that to the vendor and the vendor confirmed the backdoor and stated that yeah, yeah, this function was used for troubleshooting during development. Um, for four of the affected devices, a new firmware version was released 
and the other five products um, will not receive a security patch as the support period already ended for them. And yes, this is due to the short product lifecycle of IoT devices. So in this case, they will stay vulnerable forever. Okay, I also want to mention that I've identified some, let's say, unusual software components in device firmware. For example, TCP dump. Um, TCP dump is a tool which allows to capture um, network traffic. Um, I found TCP dump in 500 firmware images of eight different vendors, mainly in firmware files of routers and VoIP phones. And in case of a router, um, I could imagine that capturing network traffic might be a helpful feature for troubleshooting, for example. Um, but I don't know why you should need that for a VoIP phone. In addition, I've identified GDP. Um, GDP is a debugger used for runtime analysis of executables. I was surprised how often I found GDP in firmware files, all in all. 861 times from nine different manufacturers and uh, yeah GDP was mainly found in firmware images of security cameras routers and switches and it seems that uh, yeah developers forgot to remove these binaries um, but it's definitely not a good practice to leave that components in the image and to ship the products with them to the customer Now we come to the end of this presentation. To sum up, we have seen that it's possible to automate the process of firmware analysis. In this research, a total of 10,000 firmware files were automatically unpacked and analyzed. And the results show that, yeah, there are a lot of best practice violations. Vendors use hard-coded credentials, hard-coded keys. They forget to remove SSH keys and they even ship their products with a backdoor. A lot of software components are outdated. We've seen that more than 90% of the used kernel versions are out of support and are therefore affected by publicly known vulnerabilities. And we've seen that vendors do not make a good job in binary hardening. A lot of compiler-based exploit mitigations are simply not used. Thank you for your listening. I think we now have a few minutes left to answer your questions. Thank you very much.